great to be back with you once again in Dubai. I've loved this church for years, and it's such a joy to meet new people, as well as renew fellowship with friends that I've known for many years. Thank you for the lovely welcome. I had a great time yesterday morning with many of you who are in leadership or carrying responsibility, and it's great to see the wider family here this morning. I'm going to be looking uh, with you at Deuteronomy and chapter 32. Uh, Moses, it's called the Song of Moses in your Bible. Uh, it says that at the top of the chapter. It's interesting, Moses is famous for two songs, really. The first song was after Israel passed through the Red Sea, and he sang what's recorded in Exodus 15, which is a terrific song of worship and celebration because these guys who have been slaves for ages had been set free. And the Egyptian army, in all its power, wasn't able to get through those, uh, the Red Sea. And so Moses celebrated. Worship is a response to the revelation of God. That's what we've been doing here this morning. God has shown himself worthy of our praise, as we've been singing. And that's the first song of worship in the whole Bible, Exodus 15. It's almost like Psalm 1, worship him. It's a great chapter to look at. Here in Deuteronomy 32, it's a longer uh, psalm of worship, of praise. It's more reflective. It's looking at the ways God has led his people. And so, uh, Moses sang it later on in the story. We're looking at one, one kind of verse of this song. And it's found from verse 9. I'll read it with you. Deuteronomy 32, verse 9. The Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the allotment of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land and in the howling waste of a wilderness. He encircled him. He cared for him. He guarded him as the pupil of his eye, like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that hovers over its young, he spread his wings and caught them. He carried them on his pinions. Holy Spirit, we ask you please to breathe life into these words, into this story, this picture, that you will make it live to us. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We love your being with us. Come, Holy Spirit, shut us in with you and be our teacher. Feed our hearts, fortify us for the journey. Glorify your name through your word coming to us, Father. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we find Moses is taking an image from creation or what we sometimes call nature, like Jesus did with his parables. Jesus spoke about sowing seed and harvest. He spoke about the birds of the air. It's all God's creation, and there are messages in God's creation. And here you have this image of eagles who build their nest high up on the rock face. It's large nests and very, very high. And there comes a day when the young eagles who are born there find that life changes quite radically. And this is here to help us, beloved, because we are born again in heavenly places, the Bible says. The New Testament says you are in Christ in heavenly places. You didn't do anything to get there. You put your trust in Jesus and you're born again. That's what the Bible says. We start a new life. And like these young eagles, you know, the, 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 the shell opens. Wow, what a view. You're born there. And the eagle did nothing to get there. It's just born there. And this magnificent creature is a little, little eagle. Let's look around and think, wow, what a view. What a magnificent view I've got from here. What a wonderful place to be. And not only that, my parents go flying off uh, and they bring food. Say we say the mother eagle searches and finds, and, and really the eagles just sit there. It's pretty comfortable. 
uh, and the view is magnificent, and the food comes every day. I just have to get a bit of space next to my brothers and sisters in the nest. But life is pretty cozy, and it's a lot of fun. And uh, hey, life could hardly be better. I'm up here. I did nothing to get here, uh, and food's brought to me. And then there comes a day, it says, when the mother eagle starts stirring up the nest. That's a pretty dangerous thing to do. I mean, we're up here on the cliff. Take care, mother. Watch out. Watch out. I mean, be careful. You're stirring up the nest. You're, hey, you're making life uncomfortable for us. It's like suddenly a day comes when the mother eagle looks like she's somebody different. What's going on here? And Jesus, or at least Moses here, is saying, look, there's an image in this. Did you notice also he says, he watches over you like the pupil of his eye. Isn't that interesting? The pupil of your eye is one of the most protected parts of your body. I wonder if you've ever thought of that. Your eye is set in this bony structure of nose and forehead and cheek. Your eye is so protected. It's, it's protected by this, this bony shape. And then the eyelid is one of the fastest moving parts of your body. It's quick as an eyelid flashing. And then there's one more thing. If, if something does get through all that, you have these tears that clear up. You know, your, your pupil of your eye is phenomenally protected. It's quite extraordinary, really. One of the most protected parts of your whole body. And it says, you are kept like the pupil of his eye. He's watching over you. Now, this is an interesting experience here because he's saying there comes a day when the parent eagle starts stirring things up. That's not what we expected. We thought she'd just go and get some more food for us. We're very comfortable here, thank you. And suddenly, she's making life uncomfortable and, to be honest, a bit scary because it's a long way down from up here in this nest so I want to ask this question, or a few questions of this picture. All right, we're just going to ask the picture a few questions. The first one is this. Who is stirring up the nest? All right, who's doing it? Well, we know it's the parent eagle. But we sometimes go through experiences, you and I, as Christians, where life is suddenly, or gradually even, uncomfortable. Things happen to us. We think, what, what's going on? I, I, I didn't expect this to happen. Things happen maybe in your job situation, your family situation, your neighborhood situation, your national situation. Suddenly, things start getting very uncomfortable, which were not uncomfortable before. You're facing things you never expected to face. That happens. That happens to believers. That happens to you and me. What's going on? We begin to ask. Life used to be comfortable, predictable. Now it's not. Maybe that's happening to you. And sometimes we start saying, I know whose fault this is. It's my boss, or it's my neighbor, or it's my family. Or, you know, we can name who it is. We know who the problem is. It's them. If it wasn't for them, I'd be okay. These people are spoiling my life. Or sometimes as Christians, we're tempted to say, the devil's after me. You hear Christians say that. You say, how are you getting on? Oh, I feel the devil's getting at me lately. Life's getting difficult. I think maybe the devil's getting into my life. We tend to think that way quickly. But if you look at this story, and Bible pictures are like this, are to help you and help me. It's saying here, it's the parent who's doing it. Right? Who's doing this to me? Who's doing this to me? Ah, the parent. God is behind it. But I never thought of that. I thought this was, no, no, you can look at Bible stories. The one of Joseph comes to mind, for instance. Joseph is in a very comfortable nest. He's the favorite of his father. You remember the story of Joseph? He gets the, he gets the multicolored coats, Joseph and the multicolored dream coat. He's the favored one. He gets visions and dreams. Uh, in fact, he's a little bit obnoxious. He, he, he says to his brothers, you're going to bow down to me. And, uh, you know, he's, he's full of himself a bit. And then there comes a day, boy, the things start going wrong. His brothers turn against him. They put him in a hole in the ground. They take him out. They sell him into Egypt. Then not only does he get sold into Egypt, he's working in Potiphar's home, and Potiphar's wife lies about him. 
and he's put into prison. You think, hey, wait a minute. I'm the favored son. I'm Joseph. I'm the guy with all the promises. What's happening to me? The devil's after me. You. No, no, it's interesting. The Bible says, Joseph himself later on says, you, his brothers, you meant it for evil. God meant it for good. God meant it for good. He says, he sent me ahead to save life. But it was there. It says, it says, moved with envy, they sold him. It was their sin. It was like you can say, it's that horrible neighbor. It's that guy I work with. Yeah, you meant it for evil. They had bad intention. They were motivated by bad things. You can say, I know it's them. It's their bad things. Paul, the Bible says they were motivated by envy. But nevertheless, God meant it for good. All right, beloved, we've been singing some great songs this morning. Right from the beginning about his faithfulness is new. He's never going to fail me. It's so easy, isn't it, to sing them and not to think that. You can be kind of even a bit religious. You sing the song, but life's hard. No, you've got to translate what we sing into my understanding of what's happening to me. I'm going through difficulties. I'm facing problems. No, no. You meant it for evil. God meant it for good. God had a plan. Because God guards you like the pupil of his eye. <laughs> so I feel very accessible. You're not very accessible. You're hidden. You're safe. But God lets things happen. And it's God in this story, and this is what the story is telling us, the parent eagle, the mother, if you like, changes character, it seems and starts breaking up the nest, where she used to look after us, used to feed us, life was easy, suddenly it's far from easy. All right, you going through that at the moment? Maybe this is especially for you this morning, especially for you. So listen to what this story is telling us. God is involved in this. He hasn't abandoned, he hasn't dropped the ball, he is involved, all right? So it's the parent eagle that does it. So that's my first question. Who is the cause of this trouble? It's God. Right? Have you thought of that? Who's doing this? It's the parent who's doing it. The second thing I ask the question is, who is she doing it to? Is it that one day this uh, parent eagle kind of wakes up, she had a bad night, and just gets aggressive? You know, I'm going to stir up some, uh, some nests, you know, fly up and down. The cliff. There's another nest. I'll smash that one. And then I'll smash that one. I'll smash them all. I'll smash them. No, she doesn't smash them all. She's only got her eye on her nest. She's only responsible for her young. Sometimes when we're being buffeted, we go, do I really belong? Maybe I'm not a Christian even. People ask that kind of question. Things have gone bad. I don't know, I thought I was a Christian. and I don't know, things seem to be harder than they were before. Maybe I'm not a Christian. No, this is not a mark that you don't belong. It's a mark that you do belong. She only stirs her own nest. She's only responsible for her young. And we're told in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament the Lord chastens every child that he receives. In fact, it says this, if you don't know the discipline of the Lord, then you should wonder if you belong. See, it's possible to be religious and know nothing about God's dealings with your life. But if you're a real Christian, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You, you find God has dealings with you. God kind of interrupts your life. He, he affects situations. If you don't know God, you can say, well, I, yeah, I believe in God. You don't know what I'm talking about. It may be this morning. You don't know what I'm talking about. If you're a Christian, you know what I'm talking about. You know God speaks to you, unsettles you, challenges you. That's because we know him and we belong. It's because we belong. And it's because he loves us. He chastens us. I've got kids. I'm responsible for my kids ever since they were little. I'm responsible for them. I might see other children doing terrible things in the street, but they're not my responsibility. I might frown, but they, hey, my kids are my responsibility. It's, it's marked that you belong. 
Okay, beloved, we belong, and it's because we belong that we sometimes go through, well, you think, what's happening to me? Ah, it's because you belong, and God is sorting something out according to this story. God is working. It's a proof that you belong. Again, look at Old Testament stories. It's so good to read your Bible, see these illustrations. So in the Old Testament, it says, Jacob, I've loved It actually says, Esau, I've hated. God has no plan for Esau. He's got a plan for Jacob. Jacob is the chosen one. And so obviously life's going to be easy for Jacob because, well, he's the chosen one. No, not at all. Life's very tough for Jacob. No, he is God's chosen, but he's got character deficiencies. So God's going to deal with him. He still, he loves Jacob. He's the God of Jacob. The Bible gives him that. The Bible calls God the God of Jacob. Amazing. This rather nasty piece of work who lies and cheats and I'm the God of Jacob. Well, we heard about it. The Lord of Jacob is our refuge. We heard it in the meeting. He's our God. He's happy to be called the God of Jacob. Extraordinary. But what happened to Jacob? Well, you remember Jacob? He had to run away from home. Why? Because he cheated on his brother. He cheated on his brother. I want the inheritance. Horrible boy, snatching the inheritance. So his brother Esau wasn't very thrilled, so he ran away. He ran away. He found an uncle who was a bigger cheat than he was. Oh, Laban, my uncle. Oh, good, I can work for you. I'll work for you, Laban. So he works, and he falls in love with his daughter. He's got this beautiful daughter, Rebecca. Wow. He falls in love with her. I want to marry her. And so he says, yes, of course you can have my daughter. And he wants to marry this beautiful girl. And the day comes and he says, you have to work seven years for her. Boy, seven years. So he works seven years, seven years, seven years. Whew, seven years are up. It's the wedding day. I'm going to marry my Rebecca. Ooh, this is so exciting. And so they have the big event. They come together. He wakes up in the morning. Ah, wrong girl. He's got Leah. Who doesn't like at all? And, and then this, oh, this Laban, Laban, he slips in the other daughter. I serve for this one. Oh, you want, you want Rebecca? Yes, I do want Rebecca. Oh, another seven years, please. Whoa. Another seven years. And you'll find that Laban keeps on tricking him and changing his wages. And he, he's, he's being emptied. The Bible uses this phrase, emptied from vessel to vessel. That happens to us. God, cha- God saves us when we were yet in sin. That's who we were. We were sinners. We were messed up people. And he takes us and then he empties us from vessel to vessel. And every time you get emptied, something of the residue lies behind. And, and then you lay again and again. And God's changing you and purifying you, dealing with you. So your personality, your character begins to change as you go through things. You learn, and you learn sometimes in the pain. You begin to abandon attitudes you used to have, things you thought, no, I feel, how dare they? And later you think, no, I shouldn't be like that. And it's circumstances that change you and change you and change you. Now, some people think that you just go mature through age, you know, getting older. No, you just get older through age. You get mature by responding well to the grace of God. Maturity doesn't come. I've met some young guys and young girls who are very mature because they've responded well to God. I've met some old people who are very immature. You have to respond. God puts us through experiences. And here we find that story is telling us this. It's not that you don't belong. It's that you do belong. You'll find this happens to many Bible characters. David bursts on the scene as a young guy. He's amazing. David takes out Goliath. That's how we first kind of meet him. Wow, just took out a giant. And Saul says, come into my army. Yes, of course. And so he becomes one of Saul's captains. I mean, life looks good. It's all all straightforward now. You know, I've killed Goliath, and now I'm in Saul's army. The future's bright. The girls start singing. Saul has slain his thousands, 
David has slain his ten thousands. Saul hears that, doesn't like that. So Saul starts throwing spears at David. David's in huge danger. He, he runs away, and he's, he's in a cave. I mean, this guy who's got a, you know, young prince, look at, he's in, he's in the palace. Now he's in a cave. What's happening? God stirred up his nest. No, wasn't it Saul? Yeah, well, it was Saul. But actually, when he's in this cave, an army begins to gather to him. And another kingdom begins to come. The kingdom of David emerges. Mighty men start coming to David, and it becomes ultimately like the army of God. See, he had to be emptied from that vessel into this vessel. God was doing something that looked very painful at the time. Very difficult. What's happening to me? In fact, he said to his friend Jonathan, I will die one day at the hands of Saul. Because Saul's pursuing him. And, 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 and beloved, maybe you feel, I don't know, I, I think I might give up. Maybe you thought, I'll go to church once more, once this Sunday. I'll go in one, I don't know, I think I'll give this up. King David felt like that. Right? One of the great Bible heroes one of the great Bible heroes said, ah, I can't do this. Have you thought that? It's too hard. I can't keep it up. That's what David thought. And God allowed that. God allowed that. But Jonathan came alongside. No, 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 no. You will be king one day. You know, beloved, that's one of the reasons we have church, that you're not alone. We're not meant to be alone. And, and we're not just attenders at meetings. We become a family. You get into small groups. You get to know people. And, and you can be honest with one another. You say, boy, it's hard. Well, let me pray for you. Let me remind you. As we were reminded this morning so beautifully by our sister, you know, that, that wonderful psalm, the Lord's our refuge, our strength. You get encouraged by one another to stand through the difficult days to climb up that mountain before we can see the beautiful view that we heard prophetically before the meeting. You need one another. That's what church is. Church isn't just a meeting we come to. It's a family we belong to. And we enjoy the relational factor that helps us through. Because David went through a tough time. You think of Elijah. Eli Elijah is an amazing character. You, you know about the birth of some guys, Samuel. We know he was a little boy when he was born. And some other Bible characters, you know their history. Elijah, the introduction to Elijah is this, now Elijah. There's nothing else. Suddenly, Elijah's in your face. In fact, he's in the face of the king. So the first time you meet him, he's in the face of the king. He says, it won't rain until I say so. I mean, that's a pretty big message. It won't rain until I say so. And the rain stops. It's like no harvest, no future. It's like you saying the petrol will run out. You know, it's an amazing thing to say to an agricultural society. It won't rain till I say so. So here we go. I'm the guy who stopped the rain. What's next, Lord? Uh, do I go on a national tour? Uh, do I start preaching from Dan to Beersheba? Come and hear me. I'm the one who stopped the rain. Come and hear me. Book in. I'll be preaching. I may start the rain again. Come and hear me preach. God says to him, go hide yourself. Hide myself? I thought I'd just arrived. I thought I've got a ministry. Some of us like having a ministry. I have a ministry. I mean, I mean not an insignificant one. I can shut the heavens. I mean, come on. Go hide yourself. Hide myself. I wasn't going to volunteer for that. Actually, Elijah did volunteer. He was willing. He got emptied from vessel to vessel. Here he is on a mountain shutting the heavens. Now he's hidden by a brook. Go to the brook. Just a little stream. And the ravens will feed. The ravens? They're an unclean bird. Yeah, the raven will feed you. Oh, thanks, Father. Wonderful. And then, and then you get this wonderful word. It says, all right, arise. It's just this, interesting. It says, the day the brook dried up. 
See, he has to live through the famine. He has to live through the drought. He doesn't say, it won't rain on you. No, I'm in this nation. I care about this nation. I feel what you feel. He goes through it with them. And he's by the brook, but the brook dries up because there's no rain. And it says the day the brook dried up. I think if I was Elijah, the week before the brook dried up, I'd be thinking, I think I'm getting out of here. I'm going to die here. Maybe you're thinking that. I'm going to die here. But it says he waited till the day the brook dried up. And the day it dried up, the Lord spoke to him because he's the apple of his eye. He's watching over him. He may feel abandoned. I'm watching this brook dry up. God's forgotten. No, God hasn't forgotten. You're the apple of his eye. He knows every detail, knows every day. I can't stand this another day. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. The day it dried up, God said to him, now go to Zarephath. Oh, a widow woman will feed you. Oh, thank goodness for that. I've all had this raven giving me bits of meat. Now, a widow woman, I bet she's a great cook. I can't wait to get there. It'll be fun being to her place. I go to the widow woman. He arrives at the widow's house, and then she says, I'm about to die. I'm just preparing my last meal for me and my son. Well, she doesn't look like she's commanded. I have commanded a widow woman. Well, she doesn't seem to know anything about it. But she said, my son and I, no husband. Oh, she's a widow. So he, 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 I mean, Elijah's amazing. He stays in faith. He says, go and prepare something for you and for me. And he, listen, he draws her into his faith. That's what we're meant to be doing with our workmates, our neighbors. Draw people who don't believe into your faith. I believe in God. We've got faith to share, not just rules and regulations, faith. You can know God. You can experience God. Come in. Maybe you're our guest this morning. Let me say to you, come into our faith. Come and find a God who will keep you. That's what happens here. So it's a mark, actually, of belonging. It's a mark of belonging. It's not that, well, unless I don't belong. Maybe I don't belong. I'm going through such difficulties. No, actually, it's the mark of belonging. You're the apple of his eye. He's watching over you. You feel abandoned, but you're not at all abandoned. All right, who's doing it? The mother. God is responsible. Who's she doing it to? Her own. Her own. It's because you belong. All right, the third question when I ask it is this. When does she do it? When does she start stirring up her nest? Well, I don't think it's before they get feathers. I think they're beginning to grow, don't you? But I think the mother eagle instinctively knows it would be dangerous for them to stay still any longer. That's what it's about. The parent knows it would be very dangerous for them now to just stay still. And do you know God knows that for you? Hey, what's happening to us? Have we got to move house? Have I got to change job? Have I got to stop? Well, what am I going to do? God knows when you're too comfortable. God knows for your spiritual growth to stay still any longer isn't going to do you any good. And God's got a different, a different agenda to you and me. We want an agenda that keeps me comfortable. That's the kind of agenda I want, one that keeps me comfortable. God's got a bigger and better agenda. And he knows. It says in Deuteronomy 1, when they came to the Mount Sinai, you've been on this mountain long enough. Deuteronomy 1 verse 6. You've been on this mountain. We love being on mountains. The mountaintop experience. When the apostles went to the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John, they saw Jesus shining in glory. One of the biggest revelations in the gospel stories, Jesus is suddenly full of glory. A voice comes from heaven. They, wow, this is wonderful. Let's make some tents. Let's stay. Let's stay here. Let's stay here. Jesus says, come on, let's go down. I want to stay here. We love staying when it's bright and comfortable, but there are lessons to be learned, and there are big lessons you learn in valleys. Actually, sometimes the biggest lessons 
you learn in valleys. We instinctively like to stay where we are, if we're comfortable. We don't like being uncomfortable. We like settling. You can be like that theologically, if I may slip that in. You may say, well, I've never believed these things. I've always believed this. And you get exposed to something else. You get the possibility of the supernatural today. Well, I've never thought of that. I've never thought of that. Can God shake you up still? Oh, I'm very comfortable in my theological position. That's happened to many people. No, I don't want to know about anything new. And God says, no, no, it's dangerous for you to stay still. I've got more to show you from my word. Can God still show you more? Are you ready for change? God will move you on. When he sees it's dangerous for you to stay still any longer, beware the danger. Abraham is tested even into old age, even to take his son whom he loves, take him to the mountain and offer him as a sacrifice? You think Abraham's a man of faith. He's had terrific faith. He believed God for a son, which looked impossible. He's 100 years old. His wife's barren. He believed God. He got his promise. Now God's saying, take the promise and kill it. You think, what? But Abraham has his nest stirred up again. But he has terrific cut. By this time, this has become a, such a man of faith. When God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, and kill him as a sacrifice. The next verse says, he arose early the next morning. You think, wow, this is a man of faith and obedience. And he actually says to those waiting, we will return. You think you're going to slaughter him. But he's got faith somehow. It says in the New Testament, he received him back from the dead in a figure. In other words, he believes somehow God's promise is through this boy. Now he's telling me to slaughter him. He must have some extraordinary plan to somehow raise him up again. It's all images of what's going to happen to Jesus. And he says he drew the knife to kill his son. And he's about to do it. And God speaks to him. He says, okay, now, stop. Now I know that you love me. Wow, what a test. What a stirring of the nest. My son, it's all lovely now. Life's cozy now. I've got, I've got what everything God promised me. I'm very campy. No, no, God says, I'll stir it up again. Can God, can God stir you up again? Can he take you on to something new? See, beloved, God knows what he's doing. We must trust him for these things. Let me just ask one more question. No, a couple maybe. How does she do it? Well, she does it by making life very uncomfortable. You know, they're, they're up here on the cliff, and this mother who keeps bringing food suddenly, hey, careful, mum, you nearly pushed me off the edge. It's a long way down there. It's a bit scary. What are you doing? She suddenly becomes like an enemy. That's how she does it. She makes life uncomfortable. She makes it impossible to stay still. And my last question is this. Why? Why does she do this? Why does she stop apparently being a loving parent and kind of live, make it dangerous? Why? Well, because eagles are meant to fly. She's got a goal in view. Eagles are amazing creatures. They're stunning. They're wonderful. If you look at eagles, they are like kings of the sky. They've got this phenomenal wingspan. Wendy and I once were in you know, the mountain area in South Africa. And I remember, I remember it vividly. We were high up, and I looked down and saw eagles flying way below where we were, just soaring around. And then in, in moments, absolute moments, and without any apparent effort, they're above us. I thought, wow, these creatures are stunning. Look at, wow, look at that happen. They just soared up. They knew how to use the air currents. They weren't flapping their wings like pigeons. They're eagles. They're soaring, soaring, soaring. And they can see for miles. They're phenomenal creatures. They've got a capacity to hunt them. They're kings of the sky. They're not meant to sit in nests just eating what's brought to them. They've got a destiny. 
They've got an identity. They've got something God has planned for them. Beloved, we, the Bible says this in the New Testament, we are his workmanship. Some Bibles translate it, we're his creation. Could be translated his poem. Created in Christ Jesus for works he prepared beforehand for us to walk in. God's got bigger ambition for your life than you have. God wants more for you than you want. And he's a parent. He's a father. He's got ambition for you. That's why the mother stirs up the nest. Because the eagles are made for better things than sitting in nests. And she may care for them when they're young. But you'll find as a Christian, life sometimes starts very cozy when you first become a Christian. Then you start hitting things. What's going on? What's going on? God's at work. God's at work. So will you trust him? That's really the word this morning. I feel that's what my sister brought to us in the lovely reading she brought. Be still and know I'm God. He's the God of Jacob. He's the God of Jacob, the God who empties and empties and empties. He's happy to be called that name. He's our refuge, our strength. He's for us. And, and it says here, underneath are the everlasting arms. That's in the next chapter. It says he catches them, she catches them on her pinions. In other words, these massive spread wings, if, if they can't make it, if they struggle, she catches them. What a fantastic thing. So she stirs up these young and, and she catches them. It's like, see, you might think, oh, he doesn't even care what's happening to me. He just knocked me off the edge. No, no, no. When the parent goes searching for food, they fly miles away to get food. I was reading some stuff about eagles recently. They fly miles for food. It, their eye is not on the young when they're catching food. But when they're stirring up the nest, when they're making life difficult, you think, God's left me. God's abandoned. No, no, no. He hasn't abandoned you at all. It's at that time. He's most watching because he's going to catch you. He's going to catch you. On his pinions, he'll catch you. His eye is on you. Let me just close with the story of, say, of Peter. Peter is in the boat. He sees Jesus walking on the water. And I think by this time, Peter's learned a lesson or two. He doesn't act impulsively. He says to Jesus, if it's you... Tell me to come to you. That's a clever move. And Jesus has come. So Peter, amazingly, I mean, on this kingdom Jesus introduced, he's bringing these people into his kingdom. He says to them, you go and heal the sick. You go and do it. I'm in this. Go feed the thousands. You think, wow, you're drawing me into your world. Jesus ushered in another world and invites us in. Come into my world with me. And he's walking on water. Tell me to come to you. Come, wow, here I go. So Peter walks right out to where Jesus is. He gets right there, he's at, at hand. And then he looks at the waves. He goes, oh, wow, can't handle this. And he begins to sink. He's got as far as, he's walked to where Jesus is. And, he get, and Jesus grabs him. Why? Well, because underneath are the everlasting arms. You see, when, when Jesus calls you, you're his responsibility. See, if he calls you, he's not saying, oh, whoops, you missed it. Bye. Shame, you had to go. Goodbye, Peter. No, no, he catches him. Why? He's his responsibility. Beloved, you belong. You're his responsibility. He cares for you. He may shake up the nest. You may be going through tough times but you're his responsibility underneath are the everlasting arms he will catch you on his wings he will care for you you think i don't know what's happening that is often the case we don't know the whole thing we walk as we sang by faith not by sight we've been singing loads of stuff here this morning that ties in with what i'm saying here and we sometimes think, Lord, I don't understand. Well, he's not looking for you to necessarily understand. He's looking for you to trust him. To trust him. Say, Lord, I believe you. 
I trust you. I'm going to keep walking with you. Should we do that, beloved? Should we say, Lord, I don't understand, but I do want to fly. I want to reign in life. I want to be more than conqueror. That's what your word promises me. I'm not just tossed about and give up. No, no. God will bring us to maturity like this parent eagle wants its young to fly. God wants you to grow to maturity. It will come through pressures and difficulties. Amen? Father, I just pray for my dear friends this morning. Let your word do us good, I pray. Let us be fortified by it, strengthened by it. Please, God, use your word to bless us. Help us to respond to it with all our hearts, to trust you and put our faith in you. In Jesus' name, amen.